Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in today's video I wanted to talk about the difficulties of terraforming Mars mostly because there is so many videos and so many other ideas going around the internet where they basically portray this as a very easy to terraform planet which of course it's not. In this video you're going to learn why and hopefully you'll learn something by watching other videos as well. Welcome to What The Math. <laughs> So Mars, that's right, we're going to be talking about this beautiful planet about which we've talked about previously many many times, as a matter of fact I did terraform it uh, at least twice I believe in uh, some of the previous videos that I actually did myself long 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 time ago, those, those were actually some of my first videos, but I actually wanted to, to now talk about um, something that's a little bit different, specifically I really wanted to focus about why it's actually so challenging to terraform this planet and why even though um, the announcement from Elon Musk got so many people excited, it might might actually be close to impossible to actually materialize. And we're going to start by going into the simulation that is under core right here called solar system and go to Mars uh, right away. So basically there is Mars spinning super super fast, we might actually want to slow down just a little bit. And so we're going to try to talk about why um, some of the ideas that uh, might be presented in some of those so-called viral videos are actually kind of false. I guess one of the biggest ideas, and that's of course uh, the idea from Elon Musk as well, is, is that if we actually just nuke the uh, poles right here, if we basically throw a bunch of nuclear weapons here and also obviously on the other side, um, this might actually melt the ice, create a lot of liquid water and essentially um, create the beginning of a beautiful terraformed planet. Well here's the reason why it wouldn't actually do anything. Let's actually just for fun throw an asteroid in there just to kind of simulate the so-called nuclear explosion. So this is a little bit more than I actually wanted, but here we go. Here's one and here's another one. Um, so basically, okay, let's just say we nuke the planet. What would happen to uh, uh, to Mars now? Well, obviously it would warm up just a little bit and uh, the actual uh, poles and the actual ice there would melt. Uh, a lot of the stuff would be released into the atmosphere, a lot of the other stuff might actually fly into the outer space. And Mars might even acquire a little bit of liquid water for just a little bit and we're actually going to simulate this by adding uh, the amount that we think there is, which is about 5 times 10 to the 18th power kilograms of water, which kind of looks sort of like this, maybe a little bit less than that. All right, well, here we go. So this is what we think might actually be on Mars, um, both uh, in the poles and underground, possibly a little bit less than that. So I think this looks a little bit better. This is a little bit more realistic. And uh, the thing is, even if we release this water and if we, even if we actually nuke uh, the Martian surface somehow, because the surface of Mars is actually um, ha or has such a low uh, atmospheric pressure and because Mars is actually so cold, it's very, very unlikely that the water is going to stay uh, liquid for a very long time. All right, well, let's just imagine that because we nuked the surface of the planet, um, we also increased the surface pressure of Mars. Basically, we increased the atmospheric pressure to, like, let's just say, about 0.7 atmospheric pressures of Earth. Now, we know that uh, if we were to basically melt all of the CO2 on Mars and if we were actually to release the water um, on Mars, we would get um, something close to about 10% atmospheric pressure. It wouldn't be even be 70%. Even be but um, if we are able to um, redirect some asteroids and collide them with uh, the surface of Mars and specifically if we actually can bring nitrogen from somewhere because Mars currently doesn't have any or a lot of a nitrogen on the surface and nitrogen is like 70% of atmospheric pressure on our, on our own planet Earth. Uh, so if we were to actually bring nitrogen from somewhere and to collide it with this planet and basically create um, atmospheric pressure of about 70%, um, it would basically then create a bit of more atmospheric pressure and also warm up the planet just a little bit. So let's just spin this for a few years and you'll see how, because the greenhouse effect is much higher now, the surface pressure will start increasing and very likely melt this water. Um, so this is assuming that we somehow release the atmospheric um, or the rock-based uh, CO2 and create atmospheric CO2 as well well as deliver nitrogen from somewhere and many other volatile elements, um, not uh, oxygen though. We're not going to be able to bring oxygen this way uh, and even if we do bring it, it's going to escape pretty quickly. So let's just say we brought nitrogen, we brought a few other materials and suddenly the planet starts warming up. Uh, so after maybe a few years or so, 
Mars will warm up to the point where suddenly the water starts melting. Uh, but this, uh, because it's actually warmer now, because the atmospheric pressure um, actually increases with warmth, um, unfortunately for Mars, because its gravity is not very high, it's going to need um, a very, very, very uh, large amount of at um, atmospheric material to actually maintain the same pressure. So without um, the higher gravity that we have on Earth, Martian atmosphere is actually going to cover a much larger area. So this will actually start decreasing from about 70% to maybe about 20 or even lower percent. But let's just say we keep bringing more and more materials, we keep colliding more and more asteroids, delivering more... Um, atmospheric stuff on Mars and are able to maintain at least 70% um, atmospheric pressure here, which is really the sort of bare minimum that we need to have uh, for us to live relatively comfortably. It would be basically equivalent to living um, somewhere high in the mountains at about three to four kilometers of altitude. Like for example, in the Andes or uh, in Himalayas, uh, some people live at this altitude and it's it's relatively comfortable, it's not too bad. So let's just say we, we did all that and so now we have atmosphere and we have liquid water and now Mars looks a little bit more like Earth. As a matter of fact, if we go here and look under Earth similarity, it's about 80% similar to Earth. But unfortunately, we of course have no oxygen here. As a matter of fact, the entire oxygen has been depleted from Mars and the only way for us to get more oxygen is to either uh, use electrolysis to break down water and create more oxygen or to somehow find a way to break down CO2, which would be very challenging and there's really not that much CO2 to begin with. And the thing is, on our own planet, on Earth, uh, most of oxygen came from life. So we would maybe have to um, somehow invent some sort of a um, creature or some sort of a bacteria that can actually go on Mars and uh, create oxygen out of CO2. It would be relatively challenging uh, because the Martian surface is not very hospitable, but um, it's not impossible. It, it is quite possible using genetic engineering. But uh, this also creates a new problem. Most of life on Earth needs to have protection from um, the solar flares, from solar radiation that is coming from this direction right here. It, whenever the sun um, has any kind of a solar wind uh, come toward Mars, several things happen. One of those things is that the Martian atmosphere starts to, uh, to be stripped of basically atmosphere. It starts to decrease in size and it's actually represented in this game relatively well. Um, unfortunately, not uh, right now though, because I've reset the planet just a little bit and you can see the representative right here. So as a matter of fact, mass is currently losing about 33 kilograms per second of atmosphere. So it already lost quite a lot of mass and over the years it's going to lose more and more um, atmosphere. Basically, as the solar flares approach here, or as the solar radiation approaches, um, a lot of those ionized solar flares start stripping the atmosphere from Mars, specifically things like oxygen and hydrogen, um, and they create this kind of a tail behind Mars. And uh, this with time will once again strip the atmosphere of Mars, unless we find a way to create magnetic field. We need to have magnetosphere for Mars to be habitable and we don't have that and we don't really know how to create that. As a matter of fact, we currently have no technology, not even a single theory on how to create artificial magnetosphere, which is why Mars is a huge problem for colonization plans. But let's just say that somehow those creatures that came to Mars survived and started adding oxygen um, to the surface of this planet. The oxygen that will be present in the atmosphere will actually start creating an ozone layer, which will protect uh, Mars from some of the um, radiation, specifically the ultraviolet radiation, so some of the life might actually survive here. But once again, because there is actually no um, protection from the other solar flares, there is no magnetosphere, with time, all of this oxygen, and specifically all of this liquid water, will actually start being broken apart by the solar radiation. Um, most of liquid water actually will disappear. Uh, it won't re even take that long. It will take thousands, maybe millions of years to strip Mars entirely of the liquid water that it has on its surface. This is exactly what happened to Venus, actually because Venus used to have a lot of water, liquid water on the surface, and now it's completely dry because Sun has basically destroyed and eliminated all of water, turning it into oxygen and hydrogen. And hydrogen basically escaped into the atmosphere or basically escaped into the solar system um, because it's so light and oxygen combined with other materials creating this beautiful color you see on Venus. This is kind of what happened to Mars as well because 
Martian surface is red because it's actually oxidized. It's uh, all of the oxygen that used to be present there combined with the minerals and created this beautiful color. But hydrogen escaped and possibly ended up somewhere on Jupiter or somewhere else in the solar system. So liquid water will not survive here for a very long time. It might survive for hundreds of years, it might survive for thousands of years, but it's not a long-term solution unless we find a way to somehow create magnetosphere on the surface of this planet. And so unless we actually find a way to create a magnetosphere, what will happen first is that all of the surface water will actually start to disappear and completely desiccate the planet. And then because there is no water, we'll actually start losing most of the other things in the atmosphere and it will basically return back to where it was originally. So here, if I actually enable the climate, you'll see that uh, with time, the actual surface pressure that you see right here will very, very likely start decreasing as you see happening right now. And basically over time, it will return back to where it is today. It's uh, basically going to become a barren planet once again and uh, will be very, very dry. And this time possibly not even have any water that we released just now because all of this water will break down and uh, fly away into the outer space and not return ever again. So the idea of just nuking the poles or basically just uh, landing a few asteroids and creating atmosphere from that is not very feasible. Not only because we are, you know, we don't really have the technology to redirect asteroids yet, but also because it's not a permanent solution and Mars will definitely not be able to maintain the atmosphere, maintain the liquid water without an active magnetosphere. And this really kind of uh, underlines the importance of magnetosphere on any planet that we decide to colonize. Without magnetosphere, there is just not going to be a colonizable planet for us. And unfortunately, there aren't that many uh, options for us. So the only real... Um, terrestrial planet with magnetosphere on it is Mercury. Mercury actually does have magnetosphere even though it's not particularly strong and you can kind of see it uh, right there. Um, so it would protect us a little bit but because Mercury is so hot it's just going to be close to impossible to terraform this because it's just going to get even hotter if we place uh, a little bit of atmosphere here. So the temperature on Mercury will always stay um, above 150 degrees Celsius. Venus doesn't have a magnetosphere. It has something called um, ionosphere-based um, magnetic field, but it's not enough to protect it either. And plus, it's also very difficult to terraform for other reasons. And planets like Jupiter, um, Saturn, uh, Uranus, and Neptune, um, even though they do have a large enough magnetosphere to protect other moons, um, like for example Europa and Ganymede, uh, unfortunately they also produce a lot of radiation by themselves, which will unfortunately uh, create a, a whole new set of new problems for the humanity. So even these uh, moons and these other planets that do have a very powerful magnetosphere would be very, very challenging for us to colonize. So really it comes down to one thing. We need to first, before we decide to attempt to terraform and colonize Mars, find some sort of a theoretical model for how we can actually create a magnetic field on this beautiful planet. Now, we, we don't really understand how exactly it works on our own planet just yet, but we have some ideas. So if we can actually make it happen on this beautiful red planet, then I think we should definitely start planning colonization of Mars and other planets as well. But until then, it would be very challenging for us to permanently colonize us and turn this into a new Earth or our new world. Because, because even after a few thousands of years, uh, this planet will return back to being dry, inhospitable, and not very fun to live on. And anyway, so that's all I wanted to talk about in this video. I wanted to kind of show you um, why colonizing Mars, even though it seems so easy in those videos you may have watched, including, of course, my own video, is actually relatively challenging. Hopefully you learned something from this, and hopefully you'll subscribe if you still haven't, because in the next video we're also going to talk about other possibilities of colonization of other planets, and also, of course, exoplanets in other solar systems. And also don't forget that you can also support this channel on Patreon and this does help me get new equipment and produce higher quality videos. I'll see you guys in the next video and just for fun, let's collide a few more things into Mars because that was kind of the highlight of the video for me. And of course, we, the first thing we're going to start with is Pluto and a few other very, very large bodies that are available to us in Universe Sandbox. And let's, let's finish with the largest of them all, Sedna, and of course, Ares.
and maybe even Ceres. There we go. So now Mars is a little bit bigger, but definitely a lot hotter as well. Decrease its temperature, and let's see what it looks like after a few, uh, few years. And interestingly, the new face of Mars is actually very different from what it used to be. But because of those collisions, I've also created a moon. I've created a satellite known as Fragment. And this is a satellite of Mars that's going to orbit around it just in the same way that our moon does around our own planet. And this is actually a really good simulation of how our moon was created as well. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next video. Game you later. And as always, bye-bye.